The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I'm a whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now the whistler's strange story. Man of Distinction. Before he was halfway through the discussion, Tony Gardner knew he held the woman in the palm of his hand, that the red soul tag was as good as on the $20,000 antique dining room set she'd come to inquire about. But he didn't press. He didn't appear eager. He carefully kept it on a plane far above that. Of course, antiques were his first and only love, and Mrs. Fletcher's one extravagance was antique furniture. That was enough. They were soulmates. And I hope you realize, Mrs. Fletcher, what a delight this is to me. Really, Tony? Why? Oh, to talk to someone at long last who really appreciates a genuine antique. There's so many of the other kinds, you know. I talk to them all day. People who don't care whether it's original Duncan Fife or Grand Rapids, so long as they can tell their friends how much it costs them. Well, I'm flattered. <laughs> as a matter of fact, Mrs. Fletcher, I, I really shouldn't be in the business of selling things like this set here. I love it so much, I... Well, I can hardly bear to part with it. Well, it'll be in good hands, oh, Tony. Believe me, there aren't many people I'd give it up to. But... I guess I am rather lucky. <laughs> Indeed you are. Well, suppose you come into my office. I have to work out the delivery arrangements and so forth. Uh, you're quite sure now you've uh, made up your mind to take this. Why, of course, Tony. <laughs> you don't think for a moment I'd pass up an opportunity like this, do you? <laughs> And that's all there was to it, Tony. You give her a cordial handshake and watch her leave, holding her check for $20,000 in your hand. It's an important moment, isn't it, Tony? The end of one thing, the beginning of another. The end of the long years of struggle which laid the foundation for this moment. The Madison Avenue shop. The wealthy clientele which follow Mrs. Fletcher's lead. The end of the years of struggle which made you an expert in the style and finish of fine furniture and the style and finish of the fine women who bought it. But there's an anxious wait ahead, Tony, after that fabulous dining room ensemble is delivered. Yes, if it passes the inspection of the people you know will examine it. If it stands up under inspections as rigid as those you put it through, the way will be clear, the possibilities limitless. But only time, days of anxious waiting can tell you that. Meanwhile, there are other customers, like the fresh-looking young woman who drops in a few days later. Well, good morning, miss. How do you do? Are you Mr. Tony Gardner? That's right. What can I do for you? Oh, Mr. Gardner, I wonder if you can help me. It's the entry hall in my country house. You see, it's so large and kind of awkward that I'm having trouble with it. I see. Well, as it happens, I couldn't do much today, but I'm perhaps a friend if of you Mrs. come back... Fletcher's, if that makes any difference. Did, did you say Mrs. Fletcher? Yes. Oh, Oh, well, let's see. Uh, an entry hall, you say, big, huh? It's immense, with four doors. Mm. Well, it's hard to tell without seeing it, of course. Uh, how about something uh, large, dramatic? Uh, this Charles II chair, perhaps? Mm, uh, maybe. What about that big piece in the window, the bookcase? It's beautiful. Oh, the, the break front. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, very striking. Italian Renaissance, you know, but... It'd be uh... perfect. Just exactly right. Oh, I'm sorry. It just isn't for sale. It belongs to my refinisher, Mr. Fennig. Oh, Oh, I'm so disappointed, Mr. Gardner. I have to admit now that I really came for the breakfront. 
Mrs. Fletcher said today... That... Oh, you were out there today? She had a regular open house to show off that perfectly gorgeous dining room set you sold her. She, uh, she, she liked it then, huh? She loved it. Oh, we were all so impressed. You know, she wouldn't even let the servants dust it until the insurance people had been there. Really? Did she get her policy? Well, why not? She told me the underwriter said it was undervalued at 20000 Oh, it was really quite a bargain. <sighs> yes, yes, that's what I told her. At 20000 it was really, really a steal. With a wonderful feeling of relief, you slumped down on the love seat. The insurance men have come and gone, Tony. The risk is over, and you can step off the razor's edge onto solid ground. In the hours of work, the nights you slaved away in the private shop at the rear of your apartment were well spent. The dining room set has passed the microscopic examination of the experts. The first set of faked antiques you ever attempted to pass as genuine in the big money class has come through with flying colors. Don't you think you might be able to, Mr. Gardner? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I wasn't listening. Well, I said I wondered if you could persuade your refinisher to sell the brake front. Oh, well, Miss... Uh... Uh, Stafford, Claire Stafford. Uh, Miss Stafford, I've been thinking. I, I have a better idea. Yes? Uh, Fennig won't sell. I, I know that. But uh, I think I can obtain the matching piece to this one. You mean there's another one just like it? Oh, yes, yes. You see, the Renaissance craftsmen sometimes made their best pieces in pairs. Oh. I think I might get my agent to locate the other one. Uh, I must warn you, it will be rather expensive. Well, I was afraid of that. When can you get it? Uh, well, let me look into that. Excuse me a moment. You hurry out the back entrance down the alley to the shop, hoping Otto Fennec will be as easy to persuade this time as he was before with Mrs. Fletcher's genuine 18th century dining room set. I told you before, boss, that that piece is not... I know, I know. It's not for sale, Otto, I know. I like it so much, I want one for myself. I simply want you to make a replica of it, that's all. Oh, like I did the dining room set, you mean? That's right. When could you have it? Oh, ten days. Oh, no, make it a week. No finish or anything. Okay, boss, one week. Why, that's wonderful, Mr. Gardner. It's in Milan, according to my agent's last report. We can get it aboard. The Count Liguria sails tomorrow. I'll cable my man right away. <laughs> you, you have quite an organization, Mr. Gardner. And it takes money to operate it, Miss Stafford. As I told you, this will be a little expensive. <laughs> no one hates big prices more than I do. Oh, but... how much? $25,000. $25,000? In round figures, that is. That's a lot of money. But I can da guarantee you'll be satisfied. All I need is a few hours to make sure. Well, all right. Oh, ah, good. I'll call back for my apartment. Uh, no, no, better yet. I'll come by again, say, at four o'clock. Fine. Four o'clock. You're back in stride again now, Tony. The salesman again and loving it. There's nothing to fear now. You've passed the highest test, and the big stakes are there, waiting for you to pick them off. In a matter of minutes after Claire Stafford leaves, the genuine break front is back in Otto's shop, and he's at work on the copy. An hour later, you dash down to 8th Avenue and 27th Street to consult with your Italian representative. A radiogram, understand? I want it filed in Rome tonight and delivered through the usual channels. Well, I don't usually do this kind of work. Well, there's $50 in it for you. How's that? It's not bad. It's not good. I'll do it. Go ahead. All right, then. I'll take this down. Shoot. From the Anthony Gardner Campagna, 24 Via Porto, Roma. Have break front. Stop. Personally supervising loading Naples, Count Liguria. Forwarding documents to cover ship. <laughs> You really work fast, Mr. Gardner. <laughs> well, you see, there's no question about delivery. None at all. Here, take a look at this radiogram. Oh. Ooh. Supervising loading Naples. Count Liguria. Well. I'll have it in your hands in 12 days. Oh, I wish I knew more about furniture. You're sure it'll be as nice as the one you had in the window? Oh, the exact companion. My agent always checks those things matter of routine. 
course, Miss Stafford, if you don't want the piece, I wouldn't dream of pressing you. Oh, no, 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 I'll take it. <laughs> well, then. <laughs> uh, what about the deposit? Will a thousand be all right? Oh, yes, good, good. Uh, with the balance due on arrival. Now, uh, let's see, I have some blank checks around somewhere. <laughs> One thousand dollars. You watch her write it on the check, smile and thank her as she hands it to you and walks back out the door. As you pick up the checkbook from the counter, you realize she's absentmindedly put the radiogram in her purse. You start toward the door and then decide she'd think it odd if you followed her out onto the street. And it won't matter now anyway. As a matter of form, of course, you must call Mrs. Fletcher. Tony, I know it was horrid of me not to call you about the dining room set. Just the same, I want to thank you, Mrs. Fletcher. I do really appreciate... Oh, nonsense, Tony. What did you sell? Something nice? Well, rather, a break front. $25,000 worth. Marvelous, Tony. Who is it? Friend of yours, Claire Stafford. Oh, yes, the young business girl. Uh, business girl? Attractive person. I suppose she has a rich friend. <laughs> nice customer for you, Tony. Works for an insurance company. That's all I met her, you know. She's an antique expert. Oh, exciting, really. Investigates frauds and all that sort of thing. Tony? Uh, Tony, are you still there? Hello, Tony? Tony? Well, Tony, you've been so sure of yourself. So certain you are completely safe. But you can add it all up now. It makes sense, very good sense. Claire Stafford came into your shop this morning for one reason. To trick you into selling her a fake piece of antique furniture as the real thing. To reveal you to the world as a fraud. That's why she seems so gullible, so wealthy. And that's why she was careful to put that false radiogram in her purse. Do you thank your lucky stars it's not too late? that there's still one way out, one way to preserve the reputation you've built up so carefully with ten years of hard work, one way to save you from ruin. You take a cab across town to her apartment. Well, Mr. Gardner, I was just leaving. Oh, Miss Stafford, I, I must speak to you. It's most important. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm awfully rushed. Oh, please, it's about the break front. Well... Wait a minute, I have an idea. Why don't we have dinner together? I'm due at the Lido at 8, but there's... Plenty. Good. Well, let's go. Oh, I'm so glad we came here, Mr. Gardner. Wonderful atmosphere. Yes. Nice music. <laughs> now, about the break front, Miss Stafford, I'm terribly upset. Huh? So I noticed. Now, what is it? I'm afraid I can't get it here in time for you. But it's on the ship. The radiogram. I know, your... I know. It seems the ship isn't sailing. There's been a delay of some kind. Oh, that's where you're wrong. I checked. You what? Yes, I call the Marine Exchange. She sailed today on schedule. Oh, I was so thrilled. I wanted Listen, to make Miss sure... Listen, Miss Stafford, I'm terribly sorry, but I just can't deliver that piece. That's all. I... I brought your check along, and I'll be very happy to give it back to you. Now, that's no way to act, Mr. Gardner. We've made a deal. I have your assurance and your radiogram that the piece is on the ship. You have my deposit, and that's that. Oh, yes, but I tell you it'd Mr. be much... Mr. Gardner, there's nothing wrong with our transaction, is there? Wrong? Why, why no. No, there isn't. You have such a fine reputation, you know. I'd, I'd hate to think that... Well... Yes, yes, of course. Very well, Miss Stafford. You'll get your Renaissance break from. She changes the subject, and you make no effort to bring it back during the rest of the meal. You know now that you can't back out without making some damaging explanations, that the only way is straight ahead. The next morning early, you walk into Otto's workroom. Hey, morning, boss. Otto, how's it coming? What? What? By the break front, of course. What? Good Lord, is that all you've done? Uh, what's the matter, boss? Something wrong? Wrong? You haven't even got the front panels finished. But I, I only start this morning. Boss, what is the matter? You're man? dawdling, Otto. That's what's the matter. You're dawdling. I want that break front and I want it fast. Do you understand? Now get to it. Get to it. <laughs> Get to it. 
There's no other way, is there, Tony? With the Count de Liguria having sailed from Italy yesterday, you have just 12 days, less than two weeks, to create an imitation so perfect it will fool an expert. It doesn't seem possible, does it, Tony? But you've got to try. And while Otto is working on the replica, there's something else to take care of. The shipping papers? Uh, That's right. Why, on something coming from abroad, they'd consist of a shipper's receipt in duplicate, clearance papers, the captain's receipts, Mm -hmm. bill of lading, duty certificate. Mm -hmm, I see. Well, look, I want to know that things are being done right in my company. Uh, Could you give me a complete set of sample blanks, please? Oh, sure, mister. Glad to. Thank you. Tell you, little boxes, you say? Yes, you know, one of your old packing cases with the labels and all still on it. See, I'm going to build a little bar in my home, uh, something different. Oh, see, si, see, si. I think I find a something, senor. There, there she is, boss, all finished. Not bad, eh? Yes, yes, it's fine, Otto, it's... It's fine. I'll call the moving man to deliver it to your apartment, yeah? No, 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 no. I'll attend to that, Otto. Now, you you run along home. Get some rest. You long for rest yourself, don't you, Tony? But for you, the work is just beginning. The real work. It starts when you transfer the imitation brake front to your own apartment, lock the doors, and leave word that you're not to be disturbed. You have five days left, Tony, before the Count de Liguria docks in New York Harbor. You pray that it's enough. You spend the first few hours steaming out the dowels that hold the piece together. Most of the day is gone before you finish. Then you put each section of wood to soak in oil. Waiting for it, you stretch out for an hour or so of fitful rest. It's early morning as you start the painstaking process of warping the lintels. Evening of the second day as you treat the dowels with caustic, prepare to crack the panels. You're on your nerve now. No sleep, no rest. Just waiting, working, black coffee and cigarettes. You've forgotten there are such things as sunlight and fresh air when you finally reassemble the entire piece. Paint it with acid and wrap it in a winding sheet of cotton batting so the acid will bite in. Then more waiting, worrying, hoping, before you can even start the laborious grind of final rubbing. You work over the wood, pressing down until your hands are swollen with blisters, your back strained to the breaking point. And at last, it's finished. You step back, almost sobbing with weariness. But it's there, Tony, complete. Right down to the last artificial wormhole. You try to compare it with the original and decide that no matter how tired you are, you've got to have one more look at the original in Otto's shop. Uh, Tony Gaster. Otto. My boss, Tony. Why, Otto, you're drunk. Yeah, drunk. Why not? My boss, such a good man. So good. Everybody trusts my Tony. What What are you doing here at this hour, anyway? No. We have Italian representative now, yeah? Radiograms he sends about breakfront in Milan. Otto, oh, no, what are you raving about? <laughs> yeah. Miss Claire Stafford says she is buying breakfront like buying. Miss Stafford? She was here? Yeah, this afternoon. What did she ask you? What did you tell her? What did you tell nothing, her? Nothing, nothing. Let go. No, let go. I tell her nothing. I figure it out myself. Oh, you poor drunken fool. Fool, eh? You think the police say I'm fool, yeah? The police. Well, Otto, you're in this just as deeply as I am. No! No! I only take orders. I never make fake antique sniffy in my life. I tell the police. You're not uh, telling anyone uh, anything. You're not uh, telling uh, anyone uh, anything. Tony, boss, I, I, I never tell them. I only tell you. <gasps> please, boss! Please! <laughs> It's over very quickly, isn't it, Tony? Your eyes move from Otto's body sprawled on the floor to the break front. You stand for a moment undecided. It's yours now for the taking, if only... Hey, what's going on in there? Open up! But there isn't time. 
Someone's at the front of the shop, and Otto can't be found like this. You whirl around, kick out at a can of inflammable varnish. It spills across the floor as you back away. Your last act before slipping out into the alley is to strike a match. Toss it gently into the varnish. The workshop bursts into flame as you hurry away from it, running down the alley. You're thankful for a heavy fog that has settled down over the city, hiding your flight back to the apartment. Just, just a minute. <clears throat> morning, Mr. Gardner. Oh, oh, hello, son. Uh, the manager sent me up, sir. Hmm? He thought you'd want the morning papers uh, about the fire at your refinisher shop. Fire? What fire? Oh, we thought you knew, Mr. Gardner. No. The story's here on page two. Oh, here, uh, let me see. Oh, that poor old guy, Otto Fennig, dying in a fire like that. Oh. Uh, it's in the far column. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, that's right here. Man killed in accidental blaze. Why, this is terrible. We're sorry about the fire, too, Mr. Gardner. I guess that'll be quite a loss. Oh, yes, but Otto, I'm... Oh, I'm thinking about poor, faithful old Otto. Well, thank you, son, for letting me know. Here you are. Thanks, Mr. Gardner, and if there's anything we can do... Yes, yes, sir, I'll let you know. (laughs) Poor, faithful old Otto, indeed. (laughs) Uh, Good morning. This is Tony Gardner. Yes, Mr. Gardner. I want you to send a truck over to my apartment right away to pick up a piece of furniture. Delivery to Miss Claire Stafford, Gotham Arms. Well, Tony, you can relax now. For the first time since you learned the truth about Claire Stafford. It doesn't matter that it was necessary to destroy the finishing shop after killing Otto. There'll be a bigger shop now, won't there, Tony? No more teetering on a razor's edge of worry, suspicion. Just solid ground now, Tony, and solid customers. Later in the morning, you go down to the shop, poke disconsolately around in the alley, your face set in an expression of appropriate bewilderment. As you stand in the swirling fog, watch the fireman hose down the last steaming embers of what had been Otto's workroom. An unfortunate situation, Mr. Gardner. Hmm? Very unfortunate. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, it's too bad, too bad. I don't care about the shop, but... But poor, faithful old Otto. Is that it? Why? Oh, yes. You know, as far as I'm concerned, you're pretty convincing, Mr. Gardner. What? But, uh, then I just do what the lieutenant tells me. The lieutenant? I'm a detective. Name's Tyson. Got a warrant to pick you up. To pick me up? Why, this is insane. Well, maybe, but the lieutenant doesn't think so. Seems this Otto Fenny going to Valuable Antique, and uh, this morning a bellboy saw the same piece of furniture in your apartment. Do you have to kill him to get it, Gardner? It's a terrible shock, isn't it, Tony? The sudden panic that surges through you. And you know that an awful choice is facing you. Yes, Tony, you can confess your whole clever fraud or go to the electric chair for murder. Of course, there's only one answer. Oh, wait, I... There's another explanation to all this. Very simple one. If you'll just get in touch with Miss Stafford... Oh, the dame you had the thing delivered to? Uh, We've been uh, talking to her all morning. You have? Mm -hmm. Then she must have told you. Why, that piece of furniture's a forgery. I faked it myself. Uh Uh-uh. We took a short run up that alley, too. What? Uh Uh-uh. The piece is the real McCoy, all right. But uh, both Miss Stafford and some other experts you brought around said they'd stake their reputations on it. But they're they're wrong. I antique that counterfeit myself. Well, they're ready to swear it's the one from the shop here, and their judgment's good enough for us. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you're so positive it's genuine, the the, the, the Count Liguria, the boat, you you see... Oh, no, I wouldn't try to hand them that, Mr. Gardner. Uh Ah, because that's what started the whole investigation. What do you mean? We couldn't understand how Miss Stafford received the brake front when uh, the ship it was coming over on has been fog-bound off Sandy Hook for the last 24 hours. (laughs) 
Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Wednesday at the same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Featured in tonight's story were Joseph Kearns and Sarah Selby. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with story by Jackson Gillis and Robert Eisenbach. Music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Next Wednesday for a full hour of mystery, tune in a half hour earlier. Enjoy The Saint as well as The Whistler. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>